first of all, Zach, you're you're in the UK right now, but you're from Lebanon and you write this That's Lebanon true. Spring blog. So if you wouldn't mind, there are no street protests in Lebanon right now. There's obviously been street protests for a very long time in Syria. So if you could talk for a minute about what you see as the value of street protests or the drawbacks of them, whether they would be beneficial in Lebanon. Lebanon, um, what do you think about the situation in Syria, and what is your perspective yeah, on the occupation? Sure. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, yeah, um, the, the, the protests um, really, as we know, spread all around the world, but uh, we, we all recognize that each country has its own issues. Um, obviously, there are universal themes uh, common to all countries, which is, uh, w uh, you know, human rights, um, freedom, censorship, etc., etc. Uh, but different countries would have different pr priorities uh, from within this list. Um, saying that, I'm just trying to indicate that the Arab world would have different priorities than the people in Wall Street, than the people uh, in London, uh, where where the the, the laws. And, and the society is more developed in general. Um, you know, people in, in Egypt or in Syria or, or in Tunisia, they were uh, asking for really, very, very, very basic rights, what, what we call basic rights here in, in, in this part of the world. Um, so when, when people take to the streets over there, uh, their motive is, um, um, you know, uh, 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 is different from uh, any other place. Um, going back to the original question, yes, in Syria, um, I mean, it's, it's uh, as we all know, um, Syria lives under a dictatorship. Um, uh, the current uh, president there uh, has inherited the, the power from his father. Uh, his father ruled uh, for 30 years and uh, power for 11 years now are you with me yeah yeah um and 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 the 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 current president when he took power he was so young young that uh, he couldn't le he couldn't legally inherit the power because he was younger than the legal age to be a president there so they had even to um uh, revise the constitution for him specifically to be able to take the power uh, and as we know, he inherited the power from from his father. Uh, you know, they all come from the Assad family. Uh, so what happened now is that people took to the streets in uh, in mid March, uh, when when the movement spread all over. And really, if, if if you come from this part of the world, you will never ever imagine this that that was would happen at any moment in time. Um, uh, these states are police states, uh, they've got agents and spies everywhere, uh, they are brutal in, in uh, cracking down on dissidents, and um, really, they, they, no, they, they don't have room for, for you know, what we call opposition. Any, any even, even mild criticism, what, what could be seen as criticism, uh, could cost anybody their, their life or their fa family or their house or etc. So uh, uh, that's what happened in, in March. Um, but uh, sadly, the, the regime there um, wasn't uh, really worried about uh, his image as being seen uh, uh, responding responding in a in a bloody way, uh, and that's really what happened. Uh, he responded in a bloody way, um, you know, basically killing people. And uh, as we all know from the news, now things because it has been for a long time now in in Syria, um, s s the, the regime is is not. Uh, they they kind of know what they're doing. They are trying to. Um, initiate some uh, sectarian tensions, some religious tensions between the uh, the one society uh, so they can exploit these divisions and and basically uh, suppress the, the, the revolution from within. And that's what basically is happening now. So 
you you could probably start reading in the, in the world media now. Maybe you read it in the Washington Post, the New York Times, that civil war is looming in Syria. Um, sectarian divisions are increasing, and and yes, uh, not not officially, but y- you can't as well brush it off because. Uh, people are exploiting that the regime is is spreading uh, news and rumors and etc and um and the fact is that the the president comes from a a, a sect uh, a minority minority sect and the majority are saying well we are the majority if he wants to place it this way you know we we are the majority sect here and and it's starting to take um this uh, this image Image, which is which is marketed by the the regime, if if I can say so. I mean, I know protesters and activists, uh, uh, you know, who are um, uh, who, who who organize things and and uh, uh, publish news and etc. And, and I know very well they are very secularist. Uh, they are, you know, some of them are atheist. Uh, but I know they go to the mosque. They, they leave the mosque. Um, because because simply the regime doesn't allow, allow gatherings, doesn't allow, allow protests. Uh, you know, if if they see ten people gathering, they will look uh, at them in a very suspicious way. So, so people, um, you know, are kind of using mo- mosques to mobilize people, which I think is it's fair enough. You know, there's nothing wrong in that, as long as they are not calling for um, uh, religious. Um, uh, what's the word? Uh, totalitarianism. Uh, they, they are not calling for that. They want a civil state. They want human rights, uh, and and that's basically it. So that's that's roughly what's happening in Syria. It's it's taking long. Um, the president uh, Assad. Uh, yes, it, it, it actually today in the Telegraph. It's 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 kind of breaking news. Uh, he had a um, an interview with the Telegraph Sunday Telegraph in London and. He was kind of passing a message uh, to all over, basically to the state, saying, "If you intervene in in my country, I'm gonna initially initiate a regional war." Um, so in his in his rhetoric and in, in his state media, they always assume that the protesters are uh, being mobilized by foreign powers, um, and that's basically the propaganda the propaganda the regime is paying on his people to to keep some pe- some of the people with them is to say look this is a national uh, interest we should stick together because these foreign powers are mo- mobilizing the protesters um sadly some people uh, ha- do benefit from the regime and they will side with it it's uh, you know we can't deny that and that's how life works uh, stalin had supporters uh, hitler has supporters uh, Ceausescu had, you know, four days before he was executed, he was filling all the, the main squares. So that's what people do. They know how to play the propaganda and, and uh, gather crowds. And that's what he does sometimes. But the street protests were incredibly important in Syria, as you said, for um, it changed the perception of Bashar the Good to Bashar the Butcher. His reaction yes. mobilized yeah. people. I mean, people were still insisting that his brother was... Yeah the evil one, and he was actually good, right? Until this started, and now nobody would say that yeah. anywhere. Um, the, the man the mass murderer, and everybody knows it. Spot, so, spot on, that, spot I mean, on. I mean, horrible, but horrible way to find out, yeah. but that was necessary because there were too many people behind him that were just waiting for him and say, you know, believing his lines that it just takes time and he would reform things one day just as slowly, right? But um, but so far yeah. as, as well, like the, the suspicion... Exactly. Every single time anybody shot anybody, that propaganda mill would have it that it was Israeli intelligence or CIA, and both of which are actually quite believable, right? It's I can very much understand people believing. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. but so far as the sectarians divide, the street protests seemed also very beneficial in getting people together. You're standing right beside the people that he's saying are. Um, can't get along in the same country, but you're standing right beside them in the same protest, proving him wrong, right? Like the physical pre- presence of people in a crowd that are all working together to overthrow him sort of belies his line that they're all, they all hate each other. Is this not true? Um, I'm looking for what would be the benefit of the street protests 
continuing on as they are now. And I'm thinking if people go return to their homes and listen to the state TV, which is telling them it's a sectarian split and they're having a civil war, um, that mm -hmm. might come true. But if they are physically in the streets standing next to each other, all protesting against Bashar, then um, they're proving him wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there is a main aspect in, in the process in Syria that um, you're not allowed to do it. So you can't, um, I know people are doing it and, and they are sacrificing sacrificing their life in doing that. But uh, it's, it's the, the regime doesn't allow for it. They put a soldier on every door. They close all the main roads. They have roadblocks everywhere. They've got tanks. So really, what you see on TV are are the the cream of the bravest, the bravest that are really doing it. It's it's physically not possible. It's not just um, in terms of mobilizing. You know, it's it's to get people to where they need to be. It's difficult physically, uh, and, and 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 that's what's happening. So uh, it, it, that's one thing that it is it is very difficult. Second, you know, you you, you rightly pointed to it is that. Um, the, the, uh, Syria is in a in a strategic position geographically different, let's say, from Libya. Um, uh, 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 Syria borders Turkey, Iraq, Israel, Lebanon. Can you imagine the amount of problems that if this center wasn't stable, what's going to happen to the peripheries? A lot of things, and that's what Bashar is playing on. He's he's basically threatening. If I'm not right, I'm not going to let Israel feel right. I'm not going to let Turkey feel right. I'm not going to let Lebanon feel right. I'm going to hurt whatever I can, my, my surrounding. I'm going to hurt Iraq if I can. Uh, and uh, and saying, you know, uh, saying that, Gaddafi said that at some point. Uh, we know he, he threatened a, a regional war in Europe, uh, that, that crazy man. But Bashar, because... Um, there is a, a historical fight and instability in the Middle East and with Israel. He can uh, uh, he can play um, on 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 this on this note uh, very well, and I think it works well with some of his people. Again, going back to this type of regimes, let's not forget that it is a one rule party, uh, one party rule, and uh, the 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 ruling party, the Ba'ath Party have 2 million members out of a 20 million population. They have 2 million. These are registered members, you know, irrespective of their supporters. So if he, if he sends an order for his party members to go out to the streets, it's 2 million people. So it, he can't show to the media, look, the, you know, the people want me, but we know very well how things work. They send memos to factories. Uh, to, they send memos to offices, you know, send your people on the street, send you send your workers, you know, the factory workers to the streets, else, you know, you know what's going to happen. So that's how they do it. Um, yeah. And, and as I said, they, they exploit the fact uh, um, uh, their, 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 uh, um, their, their uh, relation with, with America and, and Israel or anti-relation, if I can say so. Mm -hmm. And just to point out there, um, the two million people in his party that you're talking about, in that in Syria, it's almost like a union where they get special benefits. They get uh, um, their education is cheaper, their jobs are better, their wages are higher, their tuition is way lower, and they get yeah. better grades. <laughs> so there is, you know, yeah, there yeah. are huge economic benefits to belonging to that party. Is why there are yeah. two million people in it. Yeah, I mean, it's it, you, you are kind of right. I mean, just to um, to be fair, it's it's free education for all for all the uh, the population because it's a short socialist country. Uh, but obviously, as as you said, um, th there is something in 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 this part of the world called the connection. Yeah, if you are not connected, you won't get good jobs. You won't get senior positions. 
you won't get benefits, etc. And the main connection is to be a party member. If you are a party member, you can speak to your bosses who can facilitate things for you, who can put you in a good position, who can um, bypass uh, any any laws, etc. So yes, the people who are members, uh, they use it either for cover or for, you know, that's how they make a living, simply. Mm-hmm. Just, I need to move on to Naomi for a minute. Naomi, um, you've been active with the uh, UK Occupy group as well as you're from the Bradley Manning Support Network is also um, part of your activism. Can you tell us a bit about the London Occupy movement, what you see as the benefit of the physical presence in the street, what are the drawbacks and um, growing pains, if any? Sure, I hope this isn't too noisy for you. Can you hear me? We're fine. Can you guys hear me? Is that all right? Cool. Um, very careful. So, yeah, the, the physical aspect of the UK Occupy movement is really interesting because, as you may know, we couldn't go to our first choice of location. We wanted to occupy Paternoster Square, which is this rather lifeless um, modern square which has been redeveloped many times in the city of London um, and the London Stock Exchange is there. So we're going to occupy there. In the event we couldn't access that because it's privately owned and Mitsubishi, having got wind of our plans, had the place barricaded off and blocked off from the public and it is still blocked off from the public today. So we ended up being um, kettled and surrounded by Metropolitan Police and have, having to settle um, just around St Paul's Cathedral, which is you know, a very beautiful, famous public building here. Um, that that has, in fact, turned out to be incredibly fortunate and interesting. Not only is there a very complex and interesting sort of ownership of land around St Paul's Cathedral, which is helping us on the legal side, but we've managed to trigger a major debate within the Church of England about what it is the Church should be doing. For the engagement with the religious community, not just Christians, but the, you know, the believers in general and non-believers has been extraordinary and that's an aspect to um, our oc- occupation which we never ever expected but it's been very strong. So the physical aspect in the UK, it's in, in Canada I think a lot of our Occupy movements after the initial protest is over they're wondering why they ought to be in the street and if there's any benefit to it in many of the locations. You know it's a very cold country. And they're wondering when this will end and what exactly they're doing it for. I think of all of our cities, Toronto is the one that he understands the meaning of the physical presence and the symbolism of the physical presence and why it's necessary because of what they went through with G20 when they tried to have a protest and were so mercilessly shut down. Um, they understand that that is a right that has been taken from the past and they need to reclaim it. And London is probably probably feeling a bit of that as well. Is that correct? Because your protests have been not always tolerated very kindly and they haven't always gone well as well. Like Vancouver also just had a riot as um, as you did and it makes people wary of public gatherings and whether it's public can be trusted to get Okay, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I mean, our presence in the city of London has been controversial, even though all sides you know, agree, and have some expressed some surprise at how sort of peaceful and cooperative we have been. Um, just today, someone from the UK Ministry of Justice has been briefing journalists saying that they that um, that the British government will review the laws that govern our right to peaceful protest to make it, you know, to sort of ban protests with tents, which I don't think they can actually do, and I think they'll have a real fight on their hands, and I think that would, even in the British courts, they would want to challenge that if that ever came to pass but it's interesting that we are actually sparking a debate on what the, what the, what the right to protest consists of in the United Kingdom we are in an unusual position among civilized countries that we don't have a written constitution so in effect we are allowed to do anything which isn't explicitly prohibited rather than you know it said you have a right to do something and there you go um, I think there's an interesting battle which is going to be fought and our legal battle to sort of you know against the um, threats from the cathedral and the corporation of london the unelected local government in in the city of london to um to evict us which is going to get underway next week um those fights are going to um invoke 
the right to protest and whether the right to protest is actually a right to effective protest because you know all all these bodies who have been talking to us or not talking to us they um, all give lip service to the right to protest in a free society but what they really mean is well if you come along and run furl your banners and shout at it and then go home that's fine with us but we don't want you staying what they really mean is you have a right to pro we recognize your right to protest as long as your protest is ineffectual and i think that there's an interesting battle to be had there because the right to protest should really be sacrosanct in a democratic society and the right to protest includes the right to effective protest damn you are alexa o'brien with us day of rage and you are in new york which we like left out last time. One of the, you know, this is a very central issue to the reason why, uh, you know, the idea of occupation is very, very critical in the United States because, um, you know, as I've said before, all of the institutions that underpin our democratic republic have been completely fiscalized and debate and protest and even religion has been turned into a spectacle of sorts. Um, one of the other things that I, I found interesting is in the Boston area where <clears throat> Harvard Divinity School is, there is uh, certainly a growth of the protest chaplains. I mean, <clears throat> I was talking to one of the protest chaplains who was at the original 17th, September 17th action in New York for Occupy Wall Street, and she has found, uh, you know, that she has essentially become uh, an organizer of uh, especially the religious left. So I think that one of the first objectives of all the street protests, as um, obviously in Syria, but even in the United States, in the UK, and in Canada, really only in Toronto, is the right to protest. The basic fundamental right to actually gather as people is the first objective of being physically in the streets. And when you have a country like Canada that is saying, sure, <laughs> um, it, you know, even in Toronto, they've been, the police have been very, very careful. And and, you know, the city halls have been very supportive. And then I think a lot of the people are wondering, well, what's next? And then they, they then comes communication and the actual trying to work out why you're there in the street and what you're doing as a democratic movement. And I really wish Clay was online with us here because um, he wrote the WL Central, which covers a lot of the growing pains of what happens when you are physically in the street with the support of your city hall and the support of the police, what then? And um, what he's come across is there are a lot of things that the actual occupation becomes, starts pushing the boundaries to the point of, you know, defecating on people's lawns and, and um, not respecting noise bylaws, which is infringing on individual rights at that point. And, and you know, what are the boundaries of the, of the, physical occupation, how do you do it while respecting other people's rights? And after you've established the right to be in the street and protest in the first place, what is the second step? Georgie, let me, let me respond to this particular issue because it's like there are small incidences of, you know, you, when you have a group of people, you're always going to have, you know, various personalities there. I mean, the reality of it is, is that the Congress in the United States, which is the branch responsible for deliberation, doesn't deliberate anymore. And the problems that our nation faces, which in, in turn creates hell on earth for other nations across the globe, are very massive. And our press has been completely fiscalized. We haven't had, intellig our intelligentsia is neutered. You know, our intelligentsia are Bill, the Bill Kellers of the world. You know, and they all have a fiduciary responsibility to some marketer or some company. This is a process that is more than just simply mobilizing political coalitions. You know, <clears throat> I realize that it's winter. It's like, okay, you know, it's like uh, Napoleon going into Russia, you know, in the wintertime. I recognize that there are strategic and tactical questions, but what is not being written about and not being credited is the creativity that is actually happening across the globe. I mean, you have the physical occupations and you have the d deliberation of the many voices within those civic squares. Occupy Wall Street, to me, is a civic square. It, it's what people do not only within the Occupy movement, you know, some people want to turn it into a traditional political coalition and certainly it might become that, but it's also the hundreds of other forms of political dissent and creativity to try to right the rudder of this nation. 
And that's not going to happen in a month. And everybody needs to chill out and focus on what they can do instead of what is, you know, the, instead of the press. I mean, the sort of the press line is like, you know, some person defecates on a lawn or somebody, you know, some drunk or, you know, decides that he wants to. And that becomes the story. There's so much riding on this right now. Um, and one of the things I think that is, it, it's not going to be a Super Bowl event. I think a lot of what we're seeing with the Occupy movement right at this moment is um, similar to what we saw one year ago when we were all waiting so breathlessly for the release of the U.S. state cables and counting down the minutes. And when they finally came, the whole entire Internet said, oh, wow, this is hard. <laughs> you know, they were expecting the world to change overnight. And suddenly they had this huge, unbelievable, believable mountain of cables to wade through and make sense of and they weren't expecting that kind of work and I think you know exactly the street movement now needs to settle down and um, get to work and it's hard there's a lot of work ahead of everybody there's years of work but um, Naomi I just wanted to talk to you for a minute about what do you think after you've established the right to actually be in the streets in the first place and you were talking about the working with the cathedral which I've been reading a bit of um what you all have been doing on Twitter. It's pretty amazing to be actually working with the cathedral in that way and a great, a great idea. But um, so do you think the communication is starting to happen there and the people connecting in a physical way? I mean, you, you've said that the physical presence next to the cathedral has been opened up unexpected avenues. To yeah, we're certainly communicating very well with actually a lot of people in the Anglican communion, if not the management of the cathedral itself, but you know, but the bishop and the dean coming to see us today was very important in making those links with the management of the cathedral work as well. I actually think that's going to be fine. Um, it's important to recognise though that the cathedral will only be one of the two parties taking us to court. The other one is the Corporation of London, who are a wholly mysterious local government body. Um, most of local government in the UK was reformed in 1832 under the Great Reform Act. The one, the one local government body which has not been reformed is that which looks after the City of London. And the City of London Corporation are not elected by anyone. They're almost wholly mysterious. I really couldn't tell you how they're selected. It's something we need to do a bit of reading up on. Um, it's an extraordinary situation in, in this day and age. And really, it's... Um, the banks. Yeah. I know, it's crazy. Isn't Absolutely it? crazy. It's the corporation yeah, who are taking the lead in wanting to get rid of us. And you know, it's, and you may can think for yourself why a totally unaccountable body, which is, I mean, you can't even talk about regulatory capture in relation to the Corporation of London because it is the financial services industry. There is no division there at all. There's not even a pretense of accountability. So it's very, it's not difficult to see why they might want to get rid of us. But, you know, if I was advising the Corporation of London, I would not, I would probably advise them not to take legal action against us because it's going to, you know, in the best estimate, it's going to take them about three months to get an eviction order. And in that time, there will be an incredible media spotlight put on them, the like they've never seen before. And we've spoken to many, many journalists this week who are really up for them and really want to talk about this body, which, you know, has sort of managed to get away with not being looked at very intently over, over, for many years. So um, that's going to be very, very interesting. Um, hmm. Does that answer your question? Or, oh, you know, I can tell you something. Can I? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. They had a, I, have, I have a question, if I can. Oh, no, sure, sure, sure. I have a question to Naomi. Um, uh, I mean, I, actually, I, I, I do, like everyone else here, probably, uh, share uh, your uh, frustration of the system and your views. And uh, But my question is, what's um, what are your demands? What are the slogans that, that is um, giving an aim or an objective for, for this gathering? Is there anything specific that everyone agrees on? I think we all agree that there is a major systemic problem and that we're at a point of crisis and that we need to look for a new way forward because our existing political system isn't really doing that. It's not really responsive to um, the needs of the majority and you know the channels of accountability don't seem to be working in the way they should. So Occupy in the United Kingdom is really about invigorating democracy, getting people to take the initiative back and creating something which is truly representative because 
you know, I mean, we are in a situation like many Western democracies where the number of people who vote in elections is really not as high as it should be. And then, the, you know, we now, our current government is a coalition. So it, in effect, that wasn't really voted in by anyone. I mean, their mandate is very, very, very for what they're doing, these sort of extreme cuts they're making is very, very slim indeed. Now, the decisions which are taken at Occupy are taken by consensus. So we can so you know, the 2,000 people who are in, you know, London might not be, you know, don't constitute the 99%, but we can say, you know, but we can say that the decisions that we do make as an assembly do absolutely represent the, the views of the people who are there because we do it by consensus. And that's a very strong route forward in an atmosphere which, you know, where the economic situation is profoundly difficult. And I don't think that adversarial politics is capable of finding their way forward. There. So that, I mean, that's what they're doing. I would say also that, you know, the Occupy movements, I think, have that in common, a concern with accountability and, you know, the, you know, the relationship between government and the financial system. I think that's true everywhere. I think it is also the case that um, occupations have to deal with um, specific issues in their own national environment. I mean, in the United States, it's abundantly clear that the coercive, me the coercive powers of the state are totally, totally out of control. The police are completely out of control in the United States. What we have in the United Kingdom, um, the police don't quite act that way here unless you're a, you know, you're, you, unless you're a black kid in the inner city or, you're an, or an Irish traveller, as we saw at Dale Farm. Otherwise, you're, you're relatively safe. Um, but what we do have in the United Kingdom we have a presumption of government secrecy and a tolerance of unaccountability. I mean, the Corporation of London would not have been allowed to, you know, survive in the United States. You know what I mean? So that's the specific problem we have to deal with here. It all ties in together. Back to Syria, where everybody, the protests started every week after Friday prayers, after everybody had convened anyway and gotten together in a physical way. Then they went out into the streets and stood by each other. And in Canada, particularly, you know, being such a huge country with such a tiny population, we become very isolationist into our own little groups that are very like us. I mean, you know, we are all on on Twitter, and you know how it can be—how you have thousands of followers who all agree with everything you say, and then you go step outside your door and discover that nobody agrees with you, <laughs> or you have your own blog, and everybody who reads it obviously agrees with you, but the person your neighbor doesn't, and the physical presence here I think is incredibly necessary because Canadians buy um we because we used to have quite a lot of socialist support and because um things didn't used to be so bad here most people have absolutely no idea of what has happened in the last 15 years and how hard things really are for people I mean e even the people protesting they say yes we understand that things are going to get hard they do not understand just how many children we have in this country that really do not have enough to eat, do not have medical support, senior citizens working three jobs who can't make their medical bills. All of this was untrue 15 years ago, 10 years ago, but um, nobody realizes it has happened because the poor in this country hide. Um, there's something I would really like to have take off, which is called in-your-face poverty, where people, the poor, you know, if you go to India, People are not ashamed of being poor. It's a fact of life. But in Canada, it's so they're so desperately ashamed that they hide out and they don't let people know how bad things are. And, you know, if you go to a protest like this and people stand up and start saying, yes, this happened to me, workers' comp did this to me, the court system did this to me, people are starting to realize that the little fairyland bubble that they live in is not what the entire of Canada looks like anymore. And if you go on the buses or anywhere and you realize that people are actually working three jobs trying to piece together two-hour shifts at minimum wage and make a living out of it, and it is ep epidemic across Canada, and most Canadians really literally don't even believe, like they don't even know this. They don't understand that we ha have children that are desperately poor and that our social um, support has collapsed. And without the physical presence standing next to people that you don't actually know and wouldn't actually meet every day, it's... Um, you'll never find this out. You won't find it out online because it's not, we all hang out in our own little circles of people exactly like us online, right? Alexa, did you have um, any more to add about the New York assemblies and the physical presence there and where you think it, the, how long term you think it will be? 
I think it's going to be long term. I mean, you know, listen, what I see is people building infrastructure. I spoke to a woman from Missoula, Montana last night on Skype for an hour, and she's building teach ins that can be done via, you know, uh, telecommunications. Um, the people that started organizing for U.S. Day of Rage, which was one of the original organizers for Occupy Wall Street, and we did five protests on the 17th and blah, blah, blah. You know, one of the things that the people that are, are want to mobilize are that, that jumped out first were people from southern and mid, you know, middle American states. People are suffering in this country. And, you know, I'll, I'll add another sort of demographic sort of characteristic is these are former military people that are organizing or people who have spouses that are in current and active duty, or people who've lost their homes to Citibank. Um, so, you know, there is definitely an awareness in this country. I think the most important goal for the Occupy movement and what I see it, have been seeing sort of happening, um, it's, you know, certainly started with Tunisia, with social media, but Within the United States, there is a infrastructure being built to challenge the market power of the traditional media. And, and so too, similarly with MENA countries, uh, there, there is the, the, the traditional press is starting to follow social media for, for news gathering. And, you know, there's Occupy Dev mailing lists, there's tons of technological working groups across the country. And there's lots of occupations like in Nashville, for example, or in Missoula, Montana. The thing too, like about the demands, like going back to Zach, like because you, um, as we know, like in MENA countries, they all started their domino day of rages, and they all had a list of demands, and th the demands were very obvious. You know, stop killing us, stop torturing us, in Syria, right? But um, the in Canada, again, like one of the lowest uh, voting rates in the world. Um, people have been so frustrated, disillusioned politically to see them actually communicating and speaking about politics is the wonderful thing. And even when they, they create a list of demands, and most of the lists of demands that you see now, right now, are um, they're very, very, well, they're, they're almost like watching kids play house. Um, it, it's like coming from people who are completely politically uninvolved there you know some of the lists contain things like Canada must stop doing this and it's something that Canada doesn't even do or you know like they a complete unawareness <laughs> what the Canadian political system actually is like or yeah think about how to fix it so the demands are you know very simplistic and very easy to ridicule but the point is obviously these are people who have never ever been politically involved before they just are frequently you know this is the first thing they've ever been active in and they think of something and they put it out and it may seem silly but the point is it's the first time that they have ever cared enough to actually put something out and it won't take long at all before they are politically sophisticated and do understand because they're communicating and they care and that list of demands very soon will become a lot more intelligent and um, and a lot more and hopefully will communicate a lot more across Canada so that everybody gets uh, um, gets to participate and people who do know what they're doing and do have the background in these acts to communicate and to teach them will. But the biggest thing is to get actually get them involved and get them feeling like they actually, what they say matters to somebody because Canada has every single election, the apathy has grown and, and people say, oh, you need to vote because you're in a democracy, which is the biggest farce because all the solutions, you know, the two men that were given a choice from every single election look the exact same, have the exact same policies, and it's no choice at all. It happens every four years. And to see these people in a tent working things out and being excited is the most wonderful thing, no matter what they're coming up with for demands, really. What we're talking about here is real power, too. You know, this is a very, very tricky scenario strategically. It's we can talk about, you know, I think what you're saying is like, and, and something I, it could be a criticism of the Occupy movement. Um, I'm not afraid of that. I just, you know, we can look at it as like the dot-com bubble. You know what I mean? It's the, the internet generation doing politics. But on a deeper level, what we're really talking about here is the execution of power by a faction that controls the United States. And, you know, to me, the United States has, is becoming very similar to Eastern Bloc countries, which I've talked to you about. You know, in the, certainly maybe not in the level of wealth. Uh, I mean, it could be if, if, if the political economy deteriorates. You know, um, 
the reality of it is, is that we are talking about how do you actually wrest power from the factions that control Egypt, that control the United States, and that control a lot of countries across the globe. And that is not some kind of uh, thing you do merely with political coalitions. If you do it with political coalitions, what, where does, what do you need underneath that? You need a citizen with an authentic sense of self-interest. Some okay. kind of, uh, you hate to use the word moral, but some kind of sense of living, uh, an act of conscience. So I understand that, you know, we ne normally have a Congress that has experts that deliberate or they can bring in experts to deliberate on important matters. But when Congress isn't working and you have people actually from all walks of life in all areas of specialty, at least engaging in an authentic act with politics, it is the beginning of something much, much more important. Because you can't get to dismantling these power structures or factions without that. Mm -hmm. And that's one, like, that is really my primary criticism, if I have one, of the people in the streets. Um, is it, you know, it, it's, it's not a criticism, it's more of a, um, a wariness of people that will go into their tent and reach consensus and say, you know, it's like we were talking last week, people in the streets that put up a website and say, give us money, give us food, give us tents, give us shelter, give us all this equipment and we will represent you. And it's like, well, then you're a political party and nobody needs somebody else to represent them. We should each have our own voice. And for me, facilitating some sort of, um, forum for each person to have their own voice and represent themselves is my agenda. But, um, you know, the only thing I am wary of is the Occupy political um, party. I don't want another political party. I want a complete change in the way we, um, in the way our political system works. In I want each person to have a voice so that they actually care about politics again and they'll actually start talking about it again and care about their votes, which Canada really doesn't anymore it's our ap apathy is by far our biggest problem in this country that you know I mean and I don't blame them at all I think this once a, once every four years vote is completely meaningless myself but um so Naomi did you have um anything to add to everything we were just talking about Alexa and I um, well, I, I gen generally agree with you. I think one of the main things we're doing at Occupy is trying to change people's perception of what the political process is and what it is they're doing. I mean, I think there's a temptation to see politics as a consumer activity. And, you know, most politicians would like you to think of politics this way. You get offered a program every five years and you have a look at it and you choose the one you like best and then you pick it at the, at the ballot box and then, you know, that's, that's you done for the next four or five years or whatever. I mean, what you know, Occupy is saying is, no, that's not the way to think about politics. The way to think about politics is not as a consumerist activity, but as a participatory activity. You join in, you self-organize, and in fact, you can get a hell of a lot done without, you know, sort of formal hierarchy or organization or any of the rest of it. It's, for people who are involved in it, I think it's a very powerful learning process. In some ways, Occupy is the... Is one of the best, you know. I, I do feel that Occupy LXX is one of the best colleges in London, and it's one that doesn't charge tuition fees. There's a, a lot of work we're going to do here. Mm -hmm. I want to add one thing. I, I interviewed for WL Central a former Gitmo uh, detainee, and he dropped uh, something was being posted on my uh, per personal Facebook profile, and he dropped a, a comment on it, you know, about a week after. Uh, Occupy Wall Street took off, and he had been following, uh, you know, for months, for since March, this sort of movement that we had been trying to build, uh, one amongst many. And, you know, he said, Alexa, he said, I, I didn't think you were going to pull it off. And, you know, uh, I said to him, I, I did it for you. You know, and that's the kind of like, uh, um, what, I, what I hear from people is not just simply... Uh, you know, the, the platform, what I hear is also the sense of empathic sense of humanity, a sense of that politics, before politics comes humanity and self-interest. And again, that's another thing with the physical presence. When somebody is standing beside you, it is so much harder to hate them than if they were in the abstract. Remember um, this week, I've been, I don't know if I've shared it with all of you, but probably um, the New York Times had an article 
people that it looks almost like the Abu Ghraib photos of the financial world. Um, this legal firm, Somebody Bomb in New York, do, we, do you know the photos I'm talking about? In the New York Times on Friday, I think it was. It was their Halloween party last year. This is a, a law firm that they are a foreclosure factory. They just go in and foreclose everybody's home that's that's their sole purpose in life um their clients are the banks and they foreclose homes it's what they do and their halloween party pictures just were all posted in the new york times i think on friday and um horrific they're people dressed up as homeless people you know in the streets i will work for signs that say we'll work for food signs that say oh i lost my home and I wasn't even served, and it completely ridiculing and making fun of their victims. Um, it's it, like I said, it's, it's like seeing the Abu Ghraib photos. People who are so dissociated from the rest of the, the, their victims, like it's sociopathic. And that, to me, I mean, that's part of the isolationist culture we live in, where people all live in their little pods, and they're able to ridicule these people because they know nothing about them, and they don't sit next to them on the bus, and they don't see them in a physical way every day as the MENA countries do see each other in the mosques and people are starting to see each other in the Occupy movements, right? And Zach, I just wanted to ask you because you had um, asked about the lack of specific demands, what do you think of what we're saying right now? Um, I mean, it's, it's not, uh, I'm not going to say anything new really, but I just want to emphasize the idea that uh, um, that the, the protest in, in, in the MENA area, they were, they, they had a very specific demands. Yes, they want freedom and they want democracy, but they were specific on what the prime minister needs to do or what the president needs to go or not, what, you know, there are, there are, there were some specific measures which they can, specific demands, with, demands yeah, which they can Message use to measure themselves the if they are Wisconsin. successful or not. Uh, and I think that's the main risk I see in the Occupy movement. If they don't get specific and, and clear in what they want, uh, people can lose interest or simply, you know, they, they're going to say, oh, what, what do these people want? So, you know, we need to be specific on, on what we want. Yes, we are frustrated by the system. We are frustrated by uh, the, the social uh, divide or, or the... Um, uh, the, 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 the distribution, but what's how do we see it? Um, g g how do we see uh, uh, things get done, or what are the things that we think we need to see for us to say, hey, you know, we achieved something. Let's go home. Uh, so that's that's. I think it's just an important thing to keep in mind. Really, is to have an objective is to have, uh, you know, a milestone to say if we have achieved it, you know, it's it's fair enough to say, you know, let's call it off. Um, because, uh, well, you know, well, le 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 let's let's be clear, it's, we're not going to be, we're not asking here for the fall of the regime as in the Middle East, are we? It's, it's you know, it's not going to collapse just like that. But in, 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 in these, in these, uh, these regimes, yes, the regimes had to fall because it was brutal, it was uh, criminal, it was, you know, it, it was everything bad, basically. Uh, here, maybe, I don't know, maybe you want to improve things, you want very specific things that's, uh, you know, revoked. Uh, I don't know, it's, you know, just throwing ideas here. Syria and Egypt are also very different from large democracies, or let me, let me rephrase that, large states like the United States that purport to be democratic republics. For one thing, it's 3,000 miles of land mass. You're talking about a very heterogeneous population. So you have multiple coalitions, multiple factions, small and large, and then the factions that control the government. You have multiple issues on several levels of government from local to federal. So this is a, it's a completely different set of circumstances. You know, certainly the government's controlled by similar factions or, or the arms of those factions, those, the military arms of those factions. But at the same time, it's also very different. And, you know, I don't see occupations not having demands. I actually see them have demands they, or declarations of... Uh, demands and they all tend to fall under similar thought processes. It's a question of 
you know, once again, thousands of people working hard, f building infrastructure for the winter, building infrastructure for consensus amongst the occupations, publishing press around what's interest, what's important to them locally. I see a lot of activity happening. I personally don't care if NBC doesn't get their one demand. They can, you know, spend the next several months sort of enjoying the porn of the Department of Homeland Security beating the crap out of protesters. You know, there are a lot of, of, of issues that are being handled also by these, give it time, and people are engaging. So this is, the, just, like, it's it, uh, building democracy again from like, the ground as, up. As an individual, um, like many other individuals, but as an individual, I do have demands for Canada. Um, my demands are, one, I wanted a far more transparent government so that people actually have the information that they need to govern themselves. And two, I want people to be able to create bills on their own, um, discuss them, debate them, create them and prioritize them and vote on them online. And if we, to me, if we, can, if we have those two things, we can do anything we want after that. We will have a model that we can reach consensus and change anything we like about this country. Those two things would give us the power to do everything. And so far as other demands, more specific demands, like the kinds that I am seeing from the Occupy movements, they get together in their general assemblies and they make demands and they put a list of them up that they've all reached consensus on. And to me, that's, you know, when you consider how many people are in these encampments and they're making demands for the entire country of Canada because you and your tent agreed on it. And I'm completely against that because, you know, you can't just sit there in your own, what amounts to your own little household and reach consensus and then go out and say that, I mean, some of them are going so far as to say, we're going to create a new constitution. And it's like, you and your tent, you are. But, you know, first of all, you need to connect with the rest of the people in the country and you need to communicate and you need to have some model of building that. So, so far as creating a list of demands, because our demands are not as fundamental as life and freedom, um, they have to be agreed upon by everybody in a democratic sort of fashion with openness and community and they can't just be agreed on by a bunch of people in a tent but um but the very basics which is changing the system so that we which is which is the uh, the transparency and the um the ability of people to create bills and debate upon them online and vote upon them that i do those are my demands zach <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that's that's pretty yeah i mean that's yeah fair enough uh uh, but but uh, the, just the, the follow up I, I, I wanted to say on my on my previous question is your spot on is from your demands it's not just getting the other side to hear you it's you don't want to alienate the people with you you want to gather people on your side and you want to make you know the picture clear and and that's uh, you know and and that's right yeah fair enough and that's what should be done. I think in the end what's going to happen is that there'll probably be some kind of, uh, this is my own opinion as one person, uh, so nobody is offended. Um, um, I think there's probably going to be a, a type of constitutional convention. I mean, U.S. Day of Rage has always had one demand, which is if we clean up our electoral system and the campaign financing that corrupts it, you essentially remedy myriad ills and abuses of a government that preys on the resources and spirits of citizens and others. Uh, Naomi? Um, well, we've already published a sort of set of first principles which was concluded actually the first day of the occupation proper we took over we started off occupying on Saturday and these demands were you know all these basic principles were, were published on Sunday and those are on our website um, there's something going through at the moment and it's taking a long time because there are certain process issues which are is to do with the Corporation of London and you know their lack of accountability but I would say that we're you know the London occupation is just over two weeks old and we are sort of getting to the stage where we are going to set up policy focused working groups you know up till now there's been a lot of setting up the camp a lot of, sort of crisis management to do with the cathedral and ongoing legal action and um, you know sort of strategic and practical working groups we're now at the point where policy working groups are going to be set up so you know I'm confident that we will come to some very interesting conclusions and some very interesting ideas about how to work forward that's all to come and you know 
bearing on what I know about you know the legal time frame we have quite a while in order to do this I mean we'll still be you know there's not if there is going to be a move to evict which is not not certain by any means we're going to be there until spring 2012 anyway so we have time once you know we're we're all confident that once people actually have the ability to represent themselves and have a voice, then um, we can move forward. The experience of establishing a process for making decisions and people seeing that you can do this and you can actually make decisions by yourself and you don't have to depend you know, on the goodwill of experts and your elders and betters to sort things out for you, that's incredibly empowering to use a word I don't particularly like. And that will change the people's way those involved see their role in democratic society moving forward. So, you know, even if we were not to come up with any concrete demands, which I don't think is true, I think we will come up with some concrete demands and proposals on how to move forward. If we, even if we didn't, what we would do, what what we're doing at Occupy London, I believe, what other Occupy occupations are doing, is incredibly powerful and will generate real life change. <laughs> A lot of the very, very specific demands that I see in the list of demands, they're very specific and they're very um, timely and, you know, they are the kind of things that will come up every few months and, you know, if you just have that one list of demands, then you need to occupy forever and keep presenting demands and to me, the system, if you change the system so that people can always participate, then you're willing. Then you've changed your whole governance, and you don't have to keep making demands every few months as something comes up. I mean, a lot of the things that I'm seeing that people are demanding in Canada are block this one act, and it's like, well, let's just have a voice to create all acts ourselves, and that would, you know, that would be a little more long term and solve all of those problems, right? Yeah. I think so. I think if it, if it were a case where we could identify very, you know, instantly identify very specific things that we need to contest about, that would imply that um, going through the existing channels was a worthwhile thing to do. I think the problem is at the moment that, you know, due to, you know, the, you know, the nature of conventional politics and our doubts about whether it really represents ordinary people, um, actually taking specific you know, specific proposals through the existing channels is clearly not the most effective way of generating change. You know, we're at a pivotal moment, um, which, you know, and, you know, as, as all you guys know, I mean, we're part of the global emancipatory movement, which started at the beginning of the year, and what WikiLeaks have done feeds into that. There's, you know, it's a very fundamental change in the way that um, citizens and government relate to each other, in the way that social organization works, and, you know, basically sort of the roles of states and hierarchy and all these very fundamental political issues. And what Occupy is doing, I believe, is starting that process of redefinition. We've spoken about it and, you know, many theorists have talked about it. But what Occupy is doing is starting to put it in practice for the first time. You know, you know Occupy talks about the 99%. Um, the occupations are clearly not the 99%, just numeric and they can't speak for the 99%, but they offer an ideal or a view or an idea rather of how the 99% might might move forward and that's the, I think the value that's being made there. Exactly, you've got a political system, a political structure that's actually quite similar to Canada too. I mean if you could first make your House of Commons a functioning House of Commons that actually was the voice of the people, then you could change all the rest of it with the non-elected rep representatives and everything exactly as we could. And, um, you know, if you've got the House of Commons working, that's your wedge. <laughs> that, that's your wedge to create all your other change, right? Yeah, I mean, and the House of Commons does work for some things. I mean, you know, I, the, the way we I thought the Bradley Manning campaign in the UK, you know, parliamentary action was a very essential part of that. But it's a a very select kind of issue now where Parliament is is valuable and I think most people understand that over the past few years I mean in the United Kingdom I imagine it's true in Canada as well we've had a few critical instances um, where the inadequacy 
of the parliamentary process or the comprom how compromised the parliamentary process is has been shown to us in no uncertain terms. I'm thinking of things like the um, the release of MPs' expenses, which was you know Heather Brook was very involved in that, and you know and that was really a pivotal pivotal moment and was disenchanted a lot of people with the conventional political system. Um, just this year, we've seen um, the collapse of the news of the world and the revelation of just how deeply embedded News International was in the decision-making process of government. I mean, basically, News International have acted as a proxy for public opinion in New York, the United Kingdom for the past 20 years or so. And, you know, and these things keep coming forward. We've just seen the Defence Secretary have to resign, basically, for... Um, Running a you know a private company from within government with the you know with the help of his friends and you know there, there are certain questions about that situation that nobody wants to nobody wants to ask but the real question that people should be asking is how you know how um, frequently this happens in government because I think there's then it's surely reason for thinking that if one minister can get away with doing this and get away with it quite happily until it's exposed in the press then you know. There may be reasons for thinking that other people are doing it too. So there are many reasons for um, thinking that present, the present system is compromised. And, you know, Occupy could move forward in a, in, a variety, in a variety of ways. But I think one potential way is that, say, say an occupation was set up in each parliamentary constituency. What is to stop an occupation, nom you know, nominating its own representative to stand for election? That could be a way in which the Occupy movement reinvigorates the existing democratic channels that we have. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, the idea of parliamentary democracy is fine. It just needs to work properly. I and mean, at the moment, those democratic channels of accountability just don't work properly. Well, exactly. And that's exactly what we have in Canada. The structure is actually here for a real democracy, but it's completely completely outdated. It's from pre-internet times. It's from the days when you had to take your horse and buggy and physically travel to somewhere to have your voice heard. So obviously you needed that representative that would, you know, and, and our population has grown so much that it's become completely cumbersome and unworkable. But it, exactly, I think England's in the same place as us. You need transparency. You need democracy. And so long as you, you need to ensure that individual rights are respected by the democracy and that, you know, the individual rights that we used to have in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are respected again, which they aren't being right now. And we've all gone, especially since 911, but even before, we've gone very much to the greater good, but, you know, that you can beat people up and throw them in Guantanamo Bay indefinitely because it's for the greater good. We need our individual rights back, but we also need our democracy functioning again and and exactly, you and I are both in countries with the parliamentary democracy. It can function. It just needs a great big update to bring it into the modern times, right? Yeah, indeed. I, w I would add one thing to that, though. I mean, I'm entirely sympathetic with what you say about transparency. And given what I've said about, you know, the secrecy at the heart of the British state and how that's our ultimate problem, obviously, that is what I think. Um, I think there's also, the, you know, the severity of the economic crisis, though, does bring another element into this. And I think there's reasons for believing that adversarial politics, just in total, just per se, is not capable of dealing with problems of this severity. I mean, ideally, what you would want is a government of national unity or something of that sort, to, to actually sort of build a consensus about how you tackle this problem, because it's so fundamental. Um, in the UK, we actually have a coalition at, coalition at the moment, but clearly they're still trading in adversarial politics, and it's not... You know, it's, it's not a government that is working sensibly. I think there is much to be said for consensus as a decision-making tool in very, very difficult times. And that is something additional which Occupy is offering, which is not, you know, it's not a usual feature of our democratic processes. Even, you know, even when, you know, in time, you know, in relatively easy times, they work quite well. Mm -hmm. And that back to what I was saying, too, that I was afraid of, um, and I'm less afraid now than I was at the very beginning, that Occupy would turn into just the alternative to our Harper government. And, you know, I would like to see something representative of all people, whether they, whoever they voted for, like a systemic change from of the structure, not just another political party that is effectively the opposition. But, um, yeah, so did you have anything else to add, Zach, for... Um, I know that Syria... No, no, no. You were, you were talking... Um, yeah, I was listening for most of the 
for the bulk of it. Yeah, I mean. Okay, well, thank you very much, all of you. It was okay. very fun. And um, thank you for joining us. We'll talk to you later. Yeah, no problem. Have a good day, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye, guys. <laughs>